Welcome to this next session of Thinking Through the Word. We're in 2 Samuel chapter 7, the chapter that unfolds for us, the Davidic covenant, a promise made to David that brings more focus and more details to that promise all the way back in Genesis to Adam and Eve that God would remedy sin's problem. And in this chapter, we're learning more and more about what that will look like in the day to come. So I want to highlight 12 stops in 2 Samuel 7 to get us thinking. And again, you may have other thoughts that you see. You may take any one of these and dwell on it. But we'll move quickly through the chapter and see this. Beginning in verse 1 and 2. Now when the king lived in his house and the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies, the king, this is David, said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. Uh, Our first stop here is to notice the expression of worship. Gratitude for what God has done and a desire for God to be glorified. That's worship. This is the heart of David, the, the man after God's own heart. And so don't miss the worship that comes from knowing what God has done for us and recognizing he is worthy of what we give. Number two comes here between verses one and eight. I dropped out these verses where God answers David. And what we find is in 1 Kings and 1 Chronicles, God answers David with a no. No, you cannot build a house for me. He tells David he shed too much blood. He's characterized as a man of war. And so God will entrust the building of his house to David's son. Uh, And you can see that in those passages, uh, but note the absence of a few verses here. Number three, what I want us to see here in, in God's word to David where he says, I took you from the pasture, from following sheep, that you should be prince over my people. This reminds us of two things. One, who David was. He was a nobody. Remember, Jesse didn't even count him among his sons when Samuel said, bring all your sons to me. So here's nobody, David, out in the pasture, not even leading sheep, but following sheep. Not a very good description. But God says, that's where you were. You you were a nobody and I made you a king. And what God is reminding us is that there is this link here. There is the shepherd prince or the shepherd king. And the New Testament is going to clearly show us that Jesus Christ is also a good shepherd and a king. And so the, the type is being set for us or painted for us and the fulfillment will come in the New Testament. So don't miss this shepherd king picture. Number four, because we're thinking of not only David, but of a future shepherd king, then the promise to David begins to be full of double meanings. Verse nine, I have been with you. Let me change our color here. I have been with you as part of the promise. I've cut off all your enemies. Think Colossians 2. Not only is the father with the son, but he makes a spectacle of his enemies triumphing over them at the cross. I will make for you a great name. The shepherd king's name will be made great. Philippians. Philippians 2. I will appoint a place for my people. This king will prepare a place and and his people will be blessed because of it. So these promises continue to unfold as promises to David for the nation of Israel and the generation that will follow, and yet they also will ring true for the generations to come. 
And so God's point is, I know you want to make me a house, but what's interesting, the Lord declares, verse 12, or verse 11, the Lord will make you a house. Then he gets specific about what that will look like because it won't be in David's generation. It's when your days are fulfilled and you die, lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you. Number five, ready yourself now for the rest of your Bible reading to be listening for the language of a son of David. Son of David. The promise of the Davidic covenant is that the promise would be fulfilled in David's offspring. Son of David, I will establish his kingdom. The promises continue to unfold. He will build a house, or in Jesus' language, I will build my church and will establish the throne of his kingdom. Jesus came in the first chapters of Mark saying the kingdom of God is at hand. He came to establish a kingdom. I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. These are significant words. This kingdom, let me step back, number six, kingdom established forever means it's a kingdom of peace. And this is where the name Solomon comes in. This son of David will bring peace. And so his name is Solomon, which in Hebrew means peace. That relationship will be father to son. Solomon will have that relationship with his God. And yet the future fulfillment of this picture of this type will be a relationship of the father to the son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men. That would be true of Solomon. He would know the discipline of the Lord and he would bear the stripes of that discipline. Well, that points us forward to Isaiah 53, that this loved son who was establishing a kingdom and building a church, who was the son of David, he too would bear the stripes. It's just that they wouldn't be deserved. He would suffer as the just for the unjust. Number seven, here in verse 15, my steadfast love will not depart from him. He will be a beloved son. Now, we know the name Solomon, but there was also another name of blessing that was given to him. Perhaps it, it appears by Nathan in a few chapters later, I believe 2 Samuel 12. And that name is Jedidiah, which equals beloved, beloved of the Lord. So my steadfast love will not depart from him. He will be a beloved son. Solomon has the name Solomon and he has the name Jedediah. He is the prince of peace. He is the beloved son. And again, we just listen forward to the New Testament. As Jesus begins his ministry, he's baptized and the Holy Spirit descends in the form of the dove. And the voice is heard, this is my beloved son. It's Jedediah. It's the fulfillment of Solomon. Solomon was great and glorious and wise and ruled in peace, but only in a fraction of what would be infinitely better in Christ. He would be the beloved reigning son who would get it right and it would be established forever. This, then, is what Nathan spoke to David from the Lord. We mentioned it already, but just remember it's the Davidic covenant. More details about what God was doing, unfolding his plan of redemption. Number nine, David responds, Who am I, O Lord God, and what is my house that you have brought me thus far? Who am I, humility, that you have brought me thus far? 
gratitude. No, no deservedness. No, I have my rights. No, I have my abilities. No, look what I've done, as Nebuchadnezzar would say later. Humility and gratitude. Lump them together and study them out as a ninth highlight as we make our way through the chapter. David pours out his thanks. What more can I say? For you know your servant, O Lord God, and because of your promise and according to your own heart, you have brought about all this greatness. That's an interesting expression that stuck out in my mind as highlight 10. Because of your promise, we often lean on that, what has God said, and according to your own heart. Do you know the heart of God for you? If not, read again the end of Romans 8 so that you can be clear about how certain we can be of God's heart being for us. And then we head down towards the end of the chapter. Verse 28. And now... Oh, no, verse 27. Here we are, verse 27. For you, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, have made this revelation to your servant, saying, I will build you a house. That's a summary of the whole promise. Therefore, your servant has found courage to pray this prayer to you. This is a great little equation that makes for its, its, kind of its own study lesson. What does the therefore point back to? Your servant has found courage because of something before. And when we look back, it's because of this revelation. God said something. Therefore, we have courage and confidence in praying. This is why when we pray Through the Bible, we can have complete and utter confidence that we are praying in Jesus' name, that we are praying according to God's will. Mark 27 as a key verse in in thinking about the way we're praying. That's number 11. And then finally, number 12. From verse 28. And now, O Lord God, you are God. And your words are true. That, that's just worth meditating as we head to this conclusion of God's blessing and promise to David and David's response of worship. We, we hear him saying, you are God. That's how I know this promise will unfold. And your words are true. But remember, God had promised All back above, he had promised ultimately the Messiah. How do we know that God is true and that he would send his Messiah? And how do we know that everything Christ accomplished is right and effectual and it is the way to salvation? Because God is God and his words are true. If we could nail down these two points in the highlight of verse 12, God's godness and God's word as true, we would be in a much better place of receiving God's promise, of praying with courage, of choosing to be wise. Because all that moves into a settledness that David concludes with, may it please you to bless the house of your servant, David, so that it may continue forever, that your words your promises, your godness toward your people would continue. And it has, it does, it will. And our lives lived in, fo- in faith, in following Jesus, our continued fulfillment of David's request that concludes this chapter. Thanks for following along. Next time, 1 Kings chapter 3. 1 Kings chapter 3 for thinking through the word, one chapter for each week, moving through the books of the Bible. It's a great journey. Please continue with us uh, as we learn and grow. God bless.